Golly, uh, we are tackling a, an enormous subject, aren't we? Um, and I almost don't know where to begin. I can remember, since I'm you know, of a certain age, that uh, in the late 1940s, when America was so triumphant, you know, everybody looked at America, uh, the Reader's Digest would come round and it would do, if you'll forgive me, missionary position propaganda for democracy. And it was uh, Eisenhower and it was all a flavor of a certain amount of innocence, but very good indeed. Now, um, uh, America is obviously the classic democracy, isn't it? Uh, it's a place where if it works, well, since what somebody called um, the last bourgeois revolution, the American Civil War. Uh, since the American Civil War, it's worked, obviously, remarkably well. Now, other parts of the world, um, how does democracy function? I'm going to come back to David Satter, who is formidable, um, trying to introduce democracy into other parts of the world. Now, um, I suppose, well, let's, let's be frank, Iraq's a disaster. The effort at the Arab Spring, look at it. Um, and I suppose Russia falls partly into that category, but I'll come back to it. The Europeans always um, make me chuckle when they say, as they used to, Europe's the home of democracy. The only real democracy that I think there is in, in Europe is probably the Swiss county of Appenzell. I can't remember whether that was Wilhelm Tell's or not, but, uh, and, uh, but that was a place where all the men gathered in the village square and voted on this, that, and the other. And um, it, uh, it only allowed women to vote, I think, in about 1977, and that's probably the reason the democracy lasted. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm teasing. <laughs> You'll allow me this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> uh, it, you could talk about old Germanic liberties as Montesquieu did, but the fact is that the, uh, the introduction to modern democracy um, in Europe really comes not with the French Revolution, though it made efforts at universal suffrage, it comes with Louis Napoleon. 1848, this extraordinary figure, the Prince President, a journalist, uh, he didn't really speak French, he was, he was pretty well Italian. Comes up as the first, well, there are touches of Mussolini about him, there are touches of Berlusconi. It's a great flashy regime. It knows how to use referendums and it can rely on the priests. That's really what does it. He gets the peasants to come out following their priests. He rewarded the church by giving it control of education. Then he goes in for a great flashy foreign policy. He's got property dealers remaking Paris, tearing down splendid old Paris and replacing it with this cinema version we have nowadays. Uh, and in a sense, and he gets triumphantly voted right up to the point where he loses the Franco-Prussian War after various other foreign policy disasters. Now, looking at this sort of thing, you can, you can see democracy being brought into a country as divided, universal suffrage democracy as divided. It's partly backward as well, at least by English standards. It doesn't have a yeoman class of independent farmers of any size as the British do. And the attempt to bring democracy into countries like that, as well, it's ended in disaster. I mean, let's be frank, it ended in disaster with the Weimar Republic as well. So when we start seeing good things about democracy, I mean, it's nowadays uh, the, the done thing, I, I think it's worth bearing in mind the caveats. I mean, again, since we're in Hungary, uh, about the only civilized place in Central Europe between the wars was Hungary 
which was the least satisfactory democracy. It still managed things with a table of magnates and all that. Um, so let's not be too keen on democracy. That's my first point. Um, my second one is really um, Russia. Uh, because I think we have to put the Putin business in the context of um, what happens when you suddenly inject uh, uh, universal suffrage democracy in countries which, to use an old-fashioned old expression, are not ready for it. Uh, Veto, the modernizing czarist foreign minister, czarist minister said, uh, you shouldn't complain that Russia has a bad government. The miracle is that Russia has a government at all. And when David Satter was saying, and my God, that was very good. I mean, I, it's, uh, I'm going to criticize him, but with huge amounts of respect. He described the uh, disasters of the early 90s. And anybody who was in Russia at that time could see the old women selling their medals for peanuts in the underpasses, and the, the terrible corruption. I myself was chased by a band of gypsies outside the, the Radisson, the Slavyansky Hotel. I remember, I mean, I could still run in those days, and by God, I ran. Um, and it was, uh, it was um, a, a, a dreadful time, and that's the background to Putin. Uh, I agree with, well, in so far, I, I'm, should we put it this way, my modesty says at this point that uh, it would be insulting to say that I know enough to be able to say I agree with David Satter, but I do. Um, the, uh, 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 now, if you're looking at Russia, the very, very first thing for Russians is going to be survival. And if you look at Putin nowadays, well, let me give you a, one statistic which I picked out. When I was last in Russia two or three years ago, I just happened to go around the literary sites, the Turgenev, uh, Tolstoy, all these things. Uh, and you just look out of the window and you see an agriculture which is working. Now, when I started teaching Russian history in 1968, it, um, the great platitude about it was that Russia had exported 20, 000, 20 million tons of grain in 1913. Then the collectivization of agriculture happened. Russian agriculture was given a mortal blow. And then by 1964, they were having to import grain from the Argentine. That was the great platitude if you wanted to criticize uh, what had was Stalin's economic method. Russia now exports 40 million tons of grain, exports. So she's done, she's done something. People say, oh, the Russians can't make anything. They do. If you go into a provincial Russian university, Saratov or Irkutsk, something like that, you can see universities which are much, be much better supplied with things than many, many universities in, in, um, in, in the West. It is simply not true to say that Russia is not making things. We heard from the economists, I don't know why the economists are so anti-Russian, anti um, that you know, the ruble was going down and they only rely on oil exports and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's, it just isn't true. <laughs> and um, that, of course, is the basis of Putin's popularity. It's uh, that Russians can, you know, survive without this awful drudge or horror tragedies that they had in the past. Um, the second point where, I th and I think I would be entitled to say at this point that I know a bit to qualify to disagree is about um, Putin's foreign policy. I, uh, the Ukraine, now, at Preskotovsk in March 1918, the Germans set up the first, well, in effect, the first Ukraine, the Rada, Hetman Skoropatsky, all that. And um, it, 
as I think you all know, it, it's, uh, its history in these months of 1918 was not uh, particularly happy. Now, the Germans themselves couldn't decide what are the eastern boundaries of the Ukraine. Uh, obviously, the, the western Ukraine, let's see, what used to be called Ruthenia, makes sense. Solzhenitsyn, incidentally, remarked, what is the worst mistake in Tsarist Russian foreign policy? They came up with the answer, the treaty in 1809 or 1810, which handed back, which, uh, uh, sorry, 1814, by which Tsarist Russia handed back Eastern Galicia to the Austrian Empire, because that's the foundation of Ukrainian nationalism as a sort of calc on uh, Polish nationalism. They even have the same national anthem. And, uh, but the boundaries, as you go, the language becomes more Russian, um, until the point where if you're in Dnepropetrovsk, it's a Russian city. Now, the problem is that if you say, recognize the sanctity of borders, stick to the borders, you are going to have that very dangerous thing a substantial minority which does not want to be part of your country. Now, the Ukrainians made various mistakes. They insisted on having the language uh, propagated in the schools. And that's bound to irritate Russian parents who don't want to have Gogol known as Chochol or Bulgakov known as Bilhakiu or something of that kind. And it's bound to annoy people in Crimea, where films had to be dubbed into Ukrainian. Now, at a certain point, it just seems to me to become realistic to say um, these Soviet borders, a lot of them are artificial. Uh, let's have plebiscites if you wanted to do it that way and restore, um, restore the borders which have some reality. I might say uh, that sort of line might go down terribly well in Hungary if you mentioned the little word Triano. What's Nagyvarod doing in Romania? Um, and uh, uh, as far as the Crimean plebiscite is concerned, well, there we are. Now, if uh, Russians feel you know, they've got Ukrainian cousins, Ukrainian grannies, all that, if they feel that... Um, Ukraine you know, is too big. Then, you know, what conceivable interest is the West in saying no? Uh, um, and there I, you know, I'd have to disagree with David Sato. The final point is, of course, does the Ukraine work as a country? I'm sorry, I'm a historian. I say the Ukraine. Um, uh, does the Ukraine work as a country? And there are so many question marks over that. I saw the, you know, what was it called? What did they call it? The Orange Revolution? I can't remember. Well, one day we'll have a cabbage revolution somewhere um, in which there's uh, uh, the forces. You can see them there, the old age pensioner, uh, the rock star, uh, the Euro MP, Tarrant, I think it was, in a tent waiting for the Cossacks to charge. We've seen it all. Um, I, I, I wish the country well. I think it's at a certain point Russia, uh, just as Marx said, the English won't be free till Ireland is free. I would say you know, Russia is only going to be properly free once it loses the desire to take over these non -national, other nationalities. I think Putin recognised it. But still, let's put this in perspective. This is a country desperately badly wounded taking on uh, a democratic system for which it's not ready and which has had its pride and prosperity considerably restored. And I just hope that Putin doesn't end up like Louis Napoleon. Thanks. Uh, Norman, thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, I'm going to throw it open on the floor and extend the time we have to 11.30 and, um, for questions. But I want to ask each member of the panel to answer a very quick question. And it's a very quick answer to it as well from me. And the ans your answer has probably already been given in longer form. But can I just ask you to reflect on this? Every, um, uh, it's always interesting to see the word 
um, democracy when it's qualified. Under the Sov in Soviet times, we're used to the phrase the people's democracy. We knew what that meant. It, didn't, it meant not a democracy. Um, now, what about the phrase that is used by uh, Putin's administration about Russia, which is sovereign democracy? Would you just like to say, beginning again with, in the same order, David, uh, uh, Miriam, and, and um, Norman, uh, uh, how you react and how you interpret and the, the significance of the administration's turn here, sovereign democracy? Start, does that work? Well, so it's uh, so sovereign democracy is uh, a way of saying that uh, uh, Russia has its own version of democracy, which in fact is not democracy. Anytime democracy is qualified, of course, it uh, reminds me of a, res a restaurant in, uh, in New York that was offering kosher style food, which meant, of course, it wasn't kosher. And it's the same thing in the case of, uh, of, dem of sovereign democracy, managed democracy, which is another name they have for it. Uh, but uh, it's a reflection of the Russian talent for mimicry, of course, that they feel they need to have, a, a, if they can't have democracy, well, they'll have their own version of democracy that some people can mistake for democracy. Thank you very much. <coughs> One thing I, I must admit I ad admire uh, Putin is for the way how he can tailor his messages to certain audiences and to certain so uh, societies. And this is done by the, by the Russian propaganda or fake news which we, we are experiencing in our, our societies that, and, and the International Republican Institute is looking into it through its Beacon project which is looking and, and John is cooperating with us in this project where we are looking into the different narratives of disinformation mm -hmm. and propaganda in the different countries of the European Union and, and also Eastern Partnership and, and the Balkans. And, and this sovereign democracy, I think the only person who is sovereign is actually President Putin himself and, and it's built on the unsovereignty of the rest of the, of, the, of the society, of the Soviet person I was talking about, people who are not even aware of their own rights and dignity are not striving for it because otherwise the sovereignty of the president will be undermined and, and as I said, I mean the only sovereign person in this democracy is, is the president himself. Um, not, not too many thoughts. I think uh, sovereign democracy means as I understand it, that if you get, say, 52% of the vote, you then uh, sweep the board. You, you get everything your way. And we're seeing this process happening in Turkey at the moment, where uh, and it will be a uh, knife edge whether he, Erdogan has a majority or, or not. <coughs> and he um, obviously takes his 51% his, um, to mean that he has the right to take over the whole of government forever and ever, amen. Uh, it's, uh, I think that's what sovereign democracy is um, likely to mean. Is the original Russian? I don't know for sure. I don't think used by, um, by Russian diplomats. I'm not sure I've ever seen it in any form of Russian. Uh, yeah. Just wondered what the Russian would be. Russian. 